So it's a, it's a great pleasure to be able to um, introduce Roberto Lugo to Cranbrook. Um, Roberto received his BFA from Kansas City Art Institute and his MFA from Penn State University, and he's currently a PhD candidate at uh, Penn State. Um, Lugo was the NCCAD 2015 Emerging Artist, and it was named one of CFAL's 15 potters to watch in 2016. Um, over the last few years, he's had an amazing ascent on the ceramic scene in the U.S. and beyond, um, and I'm really thrilled to be able to, to bring him in here. Uh, Roberto is a potter, an activist, a culture maker, a rapper, a poet, and an ed educator. He's a jack of all trades, and we're really thrilled to be able to welcome him, welcome him here to Cranbrook and Poabic tomorrow um, for this uh, amazing weekend of good ceramics. So, welcome. <laughs> Somebody once told me that I would die before I be something, more likely to fry before I free something, more likely to sigh before I see something. You see, I'm not the one that's gonna tell you how you should feel. You may not know my pain, but you understand how the sutures feel, because when it rains, you understand how a roof would feel. You see, my mother told me, you broke, get a job, boy. My dad said, what you fat, you a slob, boy? Teachers told me, you can't read, so what's the point? They said I missed the period, but I think they missed the point. You see, because these walls that I see every day, the same walls that I see lines of graffiti on, these are the walls that help me to understand not to stand under hatred or inequality. I went to a wall so that I can make a peace, and when I started painting, I found my inner peace. So instead of going to walls, to get some pull, now I pull walls as my wheels turn. And as this hate burns off my chest, I think of who's the best. I see the act of making pots as a metaphor for my life, somehow taking the ground, the dirt that we walk on, and turn it into something we prize, something special, something that we look for the perfect spot for in our house. That's my relationship with clay. So to sort of put my work in context, I began as a graffiti artist in Philadelphia. And I really started because I wanted to fit in. It wasn't because I thought I was an artist. I just sort of did what I saw my older cousins doing. And I sort of had this complex of, you know, not being, you know, white enough for the white crowd and not being black enough for the black crowd. But I was still being called the N-word. I was still being called a spick. And so graffiti really gave me an opportunity to just sort of viscerally say what I wanted on a wall. And, and, and for the most part, it was an outlet. And so today, I've sort of come full circle into this point where I decided what really brings me life is sitting down on a wheel and having that peaceful moment where you're turning a pot and you feel earth in your hands and you feel sort of like this, you're, you're in touch with nature in a way that I've never been before. I grew up in a place where the only trees were light poles and, you know, for the most part, the, the dirt that I'd see, the soil that I saw was from buildings that were broken down in, from uh, fires during the crack epidemic in the 80s. And so... Today, I sort of think about what graffiti can do, and I'm supposed to thinking about sort of like the, uh, the stereotype it has of being sort of a tool to, to vandalize things. I sort of think about using graffiti to deface adversity um, and sort of to, to vandalize in so many ways the, um, the things that have that happened to me in my life. And so I'll get into a few of those. But 
for the most part, what I'm doing is I'm really paying homage to people who I think um, should have paid homage, been paid homage to during their time. And so I look back at historic pots and I'll sort of take out imagery that was in them. Uh, maybe beautiful flowers, maybe the patrons that hired them. You know, a lot of these pots were sort of made for the aristocracy. And so in that place, I'll put Frederick Douglass. I'll put today Bell Hooks and Kanye West. And although these two people might be sort of on the opposite side of popularity in certain cultures, um, they've really sort of influenced me in my life because I think a lot about sort of like lyricism and how when I started to write and um, sort of have the courage to speak up and rap, I mean, that takes a lot out of one, a person to be able to get up in front of a crowd. And so, um, but often I sort of got confronted with this criticism, mostly from my, my white peers and classmates, which was like, well, if you're going to write a poem, you don't have to rhyme. It doesn't always have to rhyme. And, you know, for me, that was sort of the challenge of it, you know. And so there's these inherent things that happen where I grew up where sort of being able to figure out a way to make something rhyme and make it something cohesive and flow and sort of um, have a harmony as well as content really shows a, a comprehensive, um, you know, sort of system of words. And so that's what I'm really interested in. And so Kanye West, um, for, for not to sort of get into his content, but sort of just for the technical virtuosity of his lyricism, I sort of equate to uh, the, love, the work that I fell in love with uh, via Bell Hooks. And so to put, I would say one of the, the major things that I, I really tend to do with my work is um, I get really tired of finger pointing. And one of them is because I clearly, in my own personal life behind closed doors, I have an agenda, right? You know, I've been pulled over by police a lot. Um, you know, I've been at that moment where you're, you're just one word away from saying the wrong thing and God knows what will happen to you. You know, you get pulled over and you get asked, like, you know, what do you have in your car? Or you don't even get asked for your license. You immediately ask you know, to get out of the car, put your hand on the back of the car. A canine unit comes out and they ask you if the, you haven't even done anything wrong at this point. And they ask you if you want them to search your car and you say no. And so now a canine unit goes to your car. And at the time, I had pop, uh, a car full of pottery. I was going to Florida to visit my parents. And at the end of the day, I showed this police officer um, one of my cups. And it's one of the reasons why I put my image on a lot of my work is because, you know, I kind of wanted to be identifiable. But, you know, in many ways, this um, putting my face in a place that it doesn't belong uh, means that I'm sort of uh, propelling sort of the insecurity that I have about myself. And so I get to put my face in a place that I feel like brings it up. One of the, the things that happens with that is often um, I'm found in this place where I'm making statements that I, I don't really want to make. And so, for example, in this particular pot, um, the, the idea was to make an urn for both Trayvon Martin and Mike Brown. And so when I did that, my idea was really to say these people are worthy of an urn. These people are worthy of being paid homage to. Regardless of what side you are on, if you think the police officer didn't do anything wrong, or whether you think that Mike Brown was innocent, either one of those sides can't argue with the fact that he is a worthy human being and that he was clearly missed, so he's worthy of an urn. And so it's my job to represent him, it's my job to represent that culture, and to bring it up into a place where we can have a discourse. And so here you can sort of see my graffiti calligraphy in combination with sort of historic, both Chinese and European pattern. So um, this gold luster and uh, sort of the swirl pattern in the middle there references um, traditional Chinese uh, <clears throat> China painting overglaze luster fire. And then the graffiti lines that are around it, I've sort of um, hide um, amongst other motifs. And so lately I've been really finding that um, much like we, we, we looked at the, those slat of plates earlier with, with Mona Lisa, that I'm also very aware of sort of the, the wastefulness of, you know, constantly making and run through ideas because I'm somebody who gets bored really easy. I think a lot of artists are people who get bored really easy. And so, you know, the word that we use for nowadays is eclectic, right? I'm an eclectic artist. I'm postmodern. And, and, you know, in reality, I kind of wanted to figure out ways to work through a lot of ideas. And so, um, you know, I recently made this teapot chain. And I hung it up at a show to sort of reference like 90s hip hop culture where people have really big chains, but also sort of I wanted to bring in my newfound love for China painting and sort of the idea of sitting down for dinner. And then I was recently at a show and this woman asked me if she could wear my necklace and I was like, hell yeah, you can wear my necklace. <laughs> you could be anything you want. 
except for that. And everybody gets invited except for blacks. Politicians telling me that they got my back. And every time I speak up, they tell me to relax. I'm exempt from equality, but not from the tax. This piece is about my brother. We'd wrestle all the time. And my brother would always win. He's a few years older than me. And whenever he'd win, we were always wrestling pillows. He would sort of put his hands around his waist and go, world champion of the world. And I love this idea that he felt like there was no limits in life, you know. And he felt like there was no sort of ceiling to his ability. And I don't know if he actually intended to do that. But in looking back and thinking about a child from the ghetto who's Puerto Rican, who can't, you know, were to sort of make plain make-believe in the middle of a living room, thinking that he could be the world champion of the world. In so many ways, I try to like bring myself back to that moment in my life where I really felt like I could do anything. And so this ceramic wrestling belt is sort of a, um, a replica of that. But, you know, in, in sort of figuring out ways to bring my own sort of cultural history um, into the context of ceramics, I sort of think about how ceramics has been used anthropologically to sell the story of what was going on with people. You know, like we just sort of discussed Greek pottery a little bit earlier. Um, you know, you can sort of see remnants of it throughout history, um, especially if you look at mostly a lot of anthropologic museums have a large ceramic collection. And so I started to think about things that represent me, things that represent the culture that I've sort of grown to love. And so one of the things is, for example, a teapot. The first time I made a teapot in ceramics, I made it with the spout pointing downward. Because at that point in my life, I'd actually never used a teapot. At the age of 26, my first ceramic class, I'd never used a teapot. And so I thought that that's the way it worked. And so it took me a long time to sort of figure out exactly what people use a teapot for you know, what different teapot styles mean. Why did I think certain teapots looked expensive? Why was I scared about using them? And so it was sort of this, this journey into uh, self-reflection and into figuring out my own identity. And so as I started to go to school, I figured out that, um, you know, there was things about me that I wanted to add to sort of the, the conversation. And so I often think about Walt Whitman's notion of, you know, life is this beautiful play and we all get to contribute a verse. And so my verse um, usually comes with representing my Puerto Rican heritage. And so the piece that you see on the far left is called a pilon. Most of you might know it as a mortar and pestle, but we usually use this to grind up plantains and we'll serve it sort of with a gravy and that's sort of a Puerto Rican dish. And so you'll fry plantains, put it in there, mash it up, and the dish is actually used to um, actually process the food as well as the, the, the service component. And so then the piece on the far right is, uh, I'm not sure if you can tell, but that's a bong. And so, um, you know, I, I grew up around a lot of uh, drug use. However, um, I don't think I've ever seen a bong in Philadelphia when I was growing up. People would always use a Philly blunt. And so I found that sort of a representation of the culture that I'd grown to know through going to college. And then the piece in the middle is sort of this teapot that I referred to earlier. And trying to think of things in three, you know, I sort of thought, well, what do I reference? So I reference, you know, three graces? Do I reference, you know, three uncles? I can't, you know, pet boys? And then I said, oh, you know, the Beastie Boys. And I love sort of this combination of cultures because, you know, the Beastie Boys are this white hip hop group that sort of in some ways made hip hop approachable for a lot of people who had yet sort of dismissed it as a solely black music. And so in that, 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 that idea of being limitless and that wrestling belt and feeling like you could be the world champion of the world, I think about what what is it that I hope to achieve somehow with throwing and being a potter? And, you know, to be honest, uh, I, I don't want to turn this into a therapy session, but I've been through a lot of situations in my life that have sort of grown me to hate myself. And sort of that, that hatred that I have for myself has stemmed from situations where people put you down. And those situations come via race, it comes via your weight, your identity, and all these other things. And so for me, when I think about what I want to do with the wheel, I think about the potential that it has to be able to kill hate and somehow bring cultures together that currently don't connect. So I'm using it as a bridge to you know, combine different um, sort of uh, backgrounds. And so a way that I do this, for example, is in this installation where um, I have a Victorian era table and I have this graffiti um, background to it painted over a damask pattern. And as you approach the pot, you'll see that it's a porcelain sort of jar and urn and it has an image of Abraham Lincoln. And so most people would see Abe Lincoln and I'm looking at a $5 food stamp. And so the piece is, is named Food Stamp Wear. And so it's to sort of make you understand that your uh, immediate 
um, reaction to even looking at a face is completely different to someone who grew up where I am, where immediately when I see Abe Lincoln, I never thought of Honest Abe. I thought I got $5 and I can buy a lot of penny candy with that. And so that's sort of the relationship that I have with it. When I was in, uh, first got into grad school, um, it was the most traumatic moment in my life. My brother had been, in my opinion, unfairly incarcerated uh, for the sale of, well, he wasn't selling it. His friend asked him for two of his oxycodone pills because my brother has chronic back pain and he has had that since he was uh, 13 because he'd worked in a, in a Christmas re refactory with me. And so when he asked this, his friend had to set up 10 people in order to get a sentence lowered. And so my brother met him and he said, yes, you can borrow a few of my pills which, I mean, I'm not sure most of you have probably done that in your life or something, giving someone some of your medication. And so he spent five years in prison for that. My brother's locked in a state pen. Me, I make art at Penn State. You see, I'm a potter, I make plates. And he's in jail, he make plates. And I try to be a student. Shit, I got home, I opened my cupboards, and all I saw was student. I turned around and I got smacked. And all I did was stew that. I said, I'll join a synagogue. But then when it came to church, I just saw its walls crack by the cinder blocks. People's words went over my head like a cinder shop. And then my fat left my parents disappointed like a sinner's pop. And I thought I could be a veteran. But when it came to war, I just saw my Pearl Jam like that veteran band gunshots. Keep me up late nights like letter, man. I can't be a Christian. I get confused who to thank for these pots that I'm pissing in. Listen in. Around that same time, I, um, we had this visiting artist named uh, Richard Ross. And thinking about my brother all the time, I, I could barely make work. But he showed this image of these kids I'm locked up in um, prison, and I saw this sort of graffiti in the background, and it made me realize how much graffiti had sort of played a role in my life. And in reality, often graffiti is sort of built out of necessity, and people who really want to express themselves who don't currently have the opportunity to. And so um, it's often an outlet and a, and a form of representation. One of my favorite authors wrote an article on what postmodernism is and did it through the lens of children and sort of looked at all the work that she had seen through the children that she'd worked with the last 10 years and defined all the principles, all the sort of uh, defining components. One of them was representation, rep representing. And I thought of how often I'd done that and how if I could somehow work with Mr. Ross that I could create more opportunities. And so um, out of... I was really scared of showing him my work, but I decided to put my pottery in my book bag, and I showed up, and I said, Mr. Ross, will you look at my stuff? And um, he had just given a bunch of people really harsh critiques, and so I didn't know how it was going to go, especially because I was painting a lot of birds at the time. <laughs> and he invited me to show with him in Philadelphia, and um, it really is, since then, has changed my life. All the money from that show went to, to expunge records of kids that, were, um, that didn't have the ability to sort of represent themselves. And then um, <clears throat> also I was able to teach a lot of classes uh, to the community where I uh, grew up. So that was really influential. And so <clears throat> talking about sort of cross disciplines, you know, I'm predominantly known for my pottery, but I really often feel like the need to sculpt. And so one of the things I do in sort of talking about putting my faces where in a place I don't belong is sort of uh, sculpting my own face, my bust. And so often when I do that, I'll sort of think about ways to um, have conversations between opposing cultures. And so because I grew up Puerto Rican, I sort of have this relationship and, you know, I know what happens behind closed doors. And I know that Puerto Ricans are, are often really Christian. They're super prideful of their flag. And um, <clears throat> they're always sort of wearing these colors. And um, <clears throat> the lamb is sort of a, a big part of our culture, so the, the, the visual lamb um, as a representation of Christ. And so I thought about who else is like that, and then immediately it brought me to this sort of Duck Dynasty Southern American culture um, that I'd become accustomed to where, um, you know, you see a lot of camouflage, this neon orange, but the use of the flag, the use of the rebel flag, the pride that they have in sort of their heritage, the pride that they have in sort of their faith. And so these things are really parallel to my Puerto Rican heritage. But I think about how often I would be called a spick by people from this culture, how often I've seen the rebel flag in Pennsylvania. 
And <clears throat> also I thought about how my family immediately looked at most white people from the South and immediately assumed that they were racist and how that was also wrong. And so I thought by putting both my face on these things and having them face each other, it would sort of begin a conversation. So another way that that happens is, um, you know, I, I would walk around sometimes with a bandana because when you're throwing, I only kind of sweat from my face, which is a weird thing, fun fact. And, um, and so I wear this bandana around and I notice whenever I wear this bandana, like sometimes people would walk on the other side of the street. And I realize, oh, I'm wearing flannel because that's what like potters wear. And, you know, I'm sort of in the vein of, uh, of a hipster. And uh, then I have this bandana, right? And so immediately I look like a Mexican gangster to a lot of people, which is exactly what someone referred to me as my first week at um, undergraduate school in Kansas City was a Mexican gangster. And so I've always sort of had this trouble with, with being viewed immediately this way. And then I thought of my friend Margaret, who is in the studio right next to me, who wears a blue bandana all the time, and Margaret's from Oklahoma. And you know, often when I look at Margaret and I see the blue bandana, I'm like, Margaret's super fashionable. Like, check out that bandana. And I said to myself, oh, well, if I put an image of myself on one side and an image of Margaret on the other side, the pot almost reads completely different. And in some ways, I want people to immediately see these two images and make their assumptions. Do what you do normally when you see people every single day, when you look at someone who's big and you think that they, they don't know how to control themselves, or when you look at someone who's, who's black and you think that they're more likely to rob you. All those assumptions that people genuinely have, I want you to sort of look in my pot and immediately see that in yourself and allow yourself to sort of have that discussion um, on your own. And so I'm not necessarily telling you to feel a certain way, but I'm creating a platform for you to be able to. Here's a sort of series on the Bloods and Crips. Bloods and Crips are two rival gangs in South uh, Central LA, predominantly uh, with a, a, a lot of murders in the early 90s. And so I started making a series comparing um, Democrats and Republicans to the Bloods and Crips. Here's a Bloods and Crips a set of nesting heads and salt and pepper shakers. And this particular teapot is uh, sort of uh, stemming off of that, where I started to really think about what happens if I were to decor decorate for the sort of the aristocracy of the Crip gang, and which would be Snoop Dogg. And so I started making drawings of myself and Snoop Dogg, which is sort of a really famous rapper who also um, happens to be someone who admitted to being a Crip and readily makes songs about it. But at some point, I think all of us hit the, sort of this plateau where we're like, okay, do I wanna be the person who decorates pots really well and who puts people of color on a pot and puts it in this really pretty package for everybody to understand and then that's my only identity in the world? And so I, whenever that happens, I tend to like really just fuck shit up, you know? And I started to just throw away, take all the clay out of my studio and do something else. And so I started to think about that relationship with graffiti and how I often would paint and the city would cover up my painting. And so really in reality, in my mind, I was like, thank you, I can start with a new canvas. But what happened was is it developed all these layers and what I really liked was being able to see all the layers of paint that happened underneath and sort of sometimes I would sit around and imagine what the messages were underneath. And, um, and so I started making these stencils um, of myself and of other people and sort of overlaying them on, on paintings. So basically every day when I go in my studio, I have like 20 pieces of paper and I'm just constantly painting over them. Whatever happens in my mind, whatever really bothers me. Um, and you know, often it comes from sort of this place of, um, of dissension and feeling um, you know, as though I have to, this is the only way that I can really say these things because often if people meet me, I'm a really friendly person. I wouldn't ever say these things to your face. And I think that might be true for a lot of us. Um, but you know, through art, it kind of adjusts to what I needed to be. And in this way, it's an outlet. And so I'm constantly sort of painting over and over and over and over again. And just for everyone's clarification, this character's name is Dumb Donald. It's not uh, Mushmouth from Fat Albert. And so that's why he's on here. And Dumb Donald is smarter than Trump. I often try to stay away from uh, making specific political commentary, but when I think about something like sitting through um, you know, an assembly and trying to understand why other people feel the way they do, and I listen to a lecture um, you know, about how we should uh, discriminate and keep a large part of, uh, of the world outside of the United States, 
um, I start to think about friends and people that I've encountered immediately and this feeling of otherness. I think everyone in this room has felt like an other at some point. If you ever go into a place where everyone else knows each other and you don't, and so I think that the only way to really um, digest what's happening with, with um, sort of our, our refugee system is to think about that feeling where you felt like another and how our country is so built on otherness. And so I started to think about um, all the people that I know and how they felt that they discriminated against. And so I wrote down all these people's names and then I started to paint all the flags of their countries. And so this particular vase is called a century vase. And the original century vase was made 100 years after um, the United States. It, it was for the first um, 100 years of the United States, 1876 in Philadelphia's World Fair. And so it was a representation of all the things that happened in the country. And so within the vignettes of the original one, there's like, you know, all these inventions. And so in mine, I'm sort of putting all these historic images of refugees sort of fighting to exist in the United States. And so to bring back the, what I was doing with painting to my ceramic work, I started to make these large scale ceramic tiles and I put them out through all of the, the campus and I made a bunch of different colored slips and I let other people paint whatever they wanted on it. So it wasn't necessarily like a vandalism, but it was allowing other people to sort of take part in being able to share their message. And so what I found was, is people would write, you know, like I had this uh, series that said, it was Martin Luther King, one said I had a dream, and another said you fucked it up, and then someone just kept the word fucked and then drew over that. And so we had about 40 or 50 layers, and then I scraped through them to sort of expose the beauty um, that was underneath. And so this piece is called The Beauty of Adversity. And so it's just sort of a really thick tile with all this glaze that I scraped away. I started to bring that into my work. And so here's a jar with that same sort of um, technology. And so you can see that like through the, the looking at my work, there's probably some things that appeal to you more than others. And, um, and the, the same for me, but I find what's really important that a lot of artists forget is that it's not necessarily about having the best product, it's about making the thing that brings you the most bliss and says what you want it to say, even that, if that means you're gonna be poor. Um, you know, that's often what I wind up finding myself doing. Like, you know, I hear people saying, man, I really like this series of work, and I'm like, I'm not doing it anymore. I'm doing this other thing, and they're like, I hate that thing. And I'm like, okay, sorry, you know? And so here's a, Here's a series of paintings I did of me as a panda. He's a Puerto Rican panda. And this actual painting's probably maybe a little smaller than it is up here in the screen, but it's a very big painting. So I started to sort of work wall size. This painting has to do with, um, with my weight and sort of this idea of, I don't know, I, I'm not gonna get into too much of the subject of suicide, but I think for the most part, it sort of give you some insight on people that have um, depression and sort of I've suffered from depression uh, since I was a child, is that um, you often will think about sort of ways to fix your problem without dying. And so um, often I have these flashbacks of sort of like cutting my stomach open and having all these donuts fall out of it, which is sort of funny, you know, uh, morbid, but funny all the, nonetheless. And so I started to, you know, um, play around with that idea. And I think one of the things that happens is that, as I was mentioning earlier, artists tend to get pigeonholed, you know? We, we make one thing and then people think we're only about that thing. And personally, I'm not all about hip hop and I'm not about rapping and I'm not just about, um, you know, the facing adversity or doing work about, I, I'm not just one of those things. I'm really complicated and I think all people are. And so in many ways, I have to make work about that. And so um, one of the biggest parts of my life is living as an obese person and often you find that, um, you know, particularly men are often afraid to talk about it. You know, like you have identity issues, you don't like yourself, um, and it's the same, uh, and that also for me does the same thing as the work that I do with race, but it often crosses genders. And so I remember one, one time that I made a, a piece of myself and I, I like avoided being naked all throughout art school. I was like, I do not wanna be naked for any art. I was like, that's the number one thing I'm gonna promise myself. And what, what's the first thing I do my junior year is I take a naked photo of me squeezing my fat as I do when I get out of the shower sometimes just wishing it wasn't there. And I put this image on a platter and I bring it to school, a ceramics, a school that's really well known for well rendered plates and pots. And so the school said, this is a terrible effing plate. The glaze sucks, it's super heavy, and we think that you could do, make a better plate. And the entire conversation about the content was completely ignored. And what that told me is that 
I was showing it to the wrong audience because if I can put my soul into a piece and overcome the biggest fear I have and all you can say is that's a terrible fucking play, you're not my audience. And so I applied with that same plate to outside, and not only did it get into a really well-recognized art exhibition, but I won an award for it. But the biggest reward was two women walking up to me at the exhibition, crying and telling me, thank you for telling our story. I prefer people that empathize over people that exercise. You can work on your pecs and thighs until your body's next to God, but if your heart's anesthetized and you don't realize how your judgments affect our real lives, attempt to feel, guys, you think you're real wise, but this pain can't heal my real pride. When I see my family, they comment on my weight. You haven't seen me for a year, and that's what you say? I thought you'd say I miss you. I'm so ready to kiss you. Here's some letters I wrote you. I just want to say that I wish you lived close. But instead, I hear shit like, are you drinking water? Have you tried calisthenics? Do you still have all your toes, Rob? I know you're diabetic. Stop asking me these questions. They come off as pathetic. All that weight that you carry, man, that must feel like a boulder. The only weight that bothers me is the weight on my shoulders. Stop talking down to me, to us. I said enough's enough. Because if I'm in prison in my body, y'all providing the cuffs. This figure has donut handcuffs. But I think about sort of decorating these figures in the same way as I do my pots. And Nave really helped me think about decorating three-dimensional form. How do I take the same sort of decoration I put on my pots, put them on a figure, vice versa, and so they both speak to each other. This is the Old Dirty Bastard teapot. ODB, Old Dirt Dog, most known for being on an episode of MTV as a millionaire rapper and taking his kids to buy groceries with food stamps. And later on, he said that he did that because he wanted to make people feel like they weren't alone and having to use it and there wasn't any shame. But I, you know, back to sort of putting my face in these places, I'm, you know, I, I keep going back to this idea and I'm trying to figure out why is it that, um, you know, you do this. And I think in some ways, for, for personally, I love the idea that there is sort of a, a white couple who has enough money to buy one of my pots, who has my face just sitting in their living room next to pictures of their cats and next to their children, and I'm included in that family, and I'm having a conversation with them, and I'm worthy of being there. And you know what? In no other place in life would I ever be there. And so it's sort of a, a challenge for me because uh, I, like many people, have a hard time looking at my face. It's really sort of a, a hard time reflecting when you feel that way, and it's sort of a, a disorder in many ways. And so the way for me to get over that is by actually using it all the time. And people are, um, will often actually comment on, you know, how full of myself I must be. Uh, but in reality, it's sort of the opposite. And um, for me, I personally feel the power to speak on behalf of other people that feel the same way because I realize that maybe they don't have the same sort of uh, series of events that's happened in their life to give them sort of the courage to do what it is that I do. So here's a pot of my grandmother, Abuela. So this is Abuela teapot. I often paint my Puerto Rican family on my pots. Um, and, you know, so I've been trying to figure out ways to sort of integrate faces with pattern, with graffiti. And so I think this is one of, like, the best work in progress is that I've had thus far, and um, I'm sort of really proud of it. And so um, I'm going to sort of start to close up this lecture a little bit, and I think one of the things that I kind of wanted to um, share is, you know, that I, I feel as though lately I've been um, put in this place where I, I've become sort of a voice for um, a small sect of, you know, pottery, which is sort of this, I'm really kind of um, small group of, of people of color that make things with clay. And it's crazy because in reality, there's a lot of people of color that make things with clay throughout the world. Um, however, sort of American pottery and sort of the institutions that we're aware, well, well aware of and well celebrated, um, you know, have very few. And so I remember a situation where I asked a professor why I didn't get into the grad school because he was one of the only people of color that I'd ever known and I really was in love with his work and he said I fought day and night to get you in the school and no one saw the merit in it 
you know, no one thought that you were good enough. And it really broke my heart because I still, at that point, taught for 20 years and it never taught a student of color at the graduate position. And so that was really telling for me. So um, I sort of end this lecture talking about what I hope to achieve. And so um, there was this one moment where I was going um, to school uh, in graduate school and then I stopped by a gas station to get a Diet Coke because I think Diet Coke is really delicious. It's, it's scrumptious even. Um, I don't know if scrumptious is the right, you know what I mean. It's fizzy, it's all the things you love. And so um, I stopped there and then this guy comes into the gas station and he had this really souped up truck with camouflage and he had two rebel flags, which by the way, there's like no part of Pennsylvania that was part of the Confederacy. And he says to the guy at the register, he says, hey, did you see who won the lottery last night? And the guy at the register goes, no, who? And he goes, some fucking spick. And I thought to myself about all the work that I'd done in my life and how I felt like I'd overcome. And immediately in that moment in a gas station, I found myself thinking back to a memory I completely forgot about, which was moving into a white neighborhood at 11. Um, and it was a neighborhood that in two years completely moved out and all people of color moved in eventually because the housing just went that cheap. But I was really excited because there was a bit, just like most 11 year old boys, there was a baseball field in back. And so I immediately went to that baseball field and I looked for the, the first group of boys I could find so I can say, hey, can I play baseball with you? And so I did exactly that. And one kid um, pushed me, and I didn't realize that another kid was actually squatted behind me so that I would fall on the ground. Another kid put a baseball bat to my face, and he said, Spix, mow the lawn. They don't play on it. And I always remember that phrase, and I always remember that line because I thought about how much I hated them for hating me. And I thought to myself that what, what is it that I could possibly do to change this? Because if I tell the guy with the rebel flag he's wrong, he's just going to hate me more. And if I get angry, I'm just going to sort of further facilitate all the feelings he has about me. And so really I'm in this position where I have nothing to offer. And so in reality, I felt like I have a lot to offer. And what I could do is I could take the high road and invite that guy to tea. And um, I'll ask him the things that he's into, and he might say something like, I really like the way that, you know, a fire smells when you light a fire and you're cooking fish on it. That's my favorite thing in the world. And I'd agree, and I'd say that's my favorite too. And then we talk about our favorite music. He likes Bob Dylan, and so do I. And in that moment, we'd realize that we're so much like each other, and we sort of laugh about how we used to think we were so different. Thank you. If any of you guys are interested in asking me a question, you're more than welcome to. Don't be nervous. Hi. Hi. Thank you, Mr. Jordan, for being willing to share with us. Well, oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. So that's very kind of you. I'm going to cry up here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, you can call that guy right there. <laughs> Wexler Gallery in Philadelphia is, and I, I really love them. One of, the, the, one of the, the reasons why I decided to go with the gallery in my particular case was I'm mostly known for pottery, and this person paid $5,000 for an ad for me to show one of my paintings. And for me, that meant that he really believes in my message. And the moment that he did that, I said, this is a place I really want to work for because they're not going to sort of stifle me by making me just sell my pottery. Yes, I have a show. At, I have some of my work at Powabic, and um, I'm showing it. Uh, the next uh, other show I'm doing is a collective design fair. So most, most of my work is, are in design fairs like, uh, you know, Pulse and, uh, and Fog and a few other sort of fairs around the country. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's a great question, and the answer is no. I usually will just go in my studio and just throw pots because um, it's sort of like a, a, a release from all the chaos of the world. It's like the one thing I know how to do. 
you know? And so like I do that and I just do that. And then like halfway into it, I'm like, uh, yeah, I think I want to do this with it. And so I start painting a little bit with underglaze, which is sort of like usually a quick industrial thing. And then it's odd, but everybody sort of has things they don't mind spending a lot of time on. And me, I have very few of those things, but one of the things I like to do is China paint. And one of the reasons why is because it really reminds me a lot of, um, of graffiti in a way, um, sort of that same line work, but I can do it in the comfort of my home. Often it's in my lap while I'm watching the Food Network. And so there's a really nice like experience with like just like watching a little TV and just like painting, uh, painting. I also really love that most people that are recognized as China painters happen to be sort of what most would deem the opposite of me. It, it, you know, uh, uh, often they're sort of, um, you know, uh, older white women, you know, who do a lot of China painting. And um, I find it really great that I have something to talk with them about and we have a similar passion and we can make that work. And so, um, I, you know, that's something that I, I think is a really great part of my practice. Yeah. Yes. Do you think of your practice as kind of, you know, do, do you incorporate the actual making as kind of performance as well in, in, in some sort of way? I mean, do you think about it in, in that way as well? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's so weird, but like I've been getting to my studio like 11 at night, and then I even brought in a record player, and I have a certain amount of incense I light, and it's like this whole ritual, and I, I kind of feel like people are watching me while I'm doing it, you know? <laughs> it's the weirdest thing, but I'm like, you know, putting paint, and I'm like, you guys see that? You know, but it's really just me. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I feel like the, 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 the performance is in me even being an artist. You know, I have 50 first cousins and all the males have been incarcerated at one point in their life, you know, um, and I'm the only one who hasn't. And so I feel like really determined and challenged to sort of represent for all of them. And so often I, I really do feel like uh, aside from um, some of the sort of exposure that I've gotten w within pottery, I feel like I'm always um, in front of their eyes because they're always looking for me to sort of say, well, at least Robert made it, you know? And so that feels really nice. Yeah. Yes. This is the Wu-Tang Clan uh, sweater uh, necklace shirt. And um, I recently had a show called Wu-Tang Worcester. And so uh, I was thinking about Worcester porcelain and sort of the history of Charles Fergus Binns. Um, who really started Alfred coming here and sort of the relationship between he and I, you know, like we're both sort of uh, potters who, who make work in America. And so I love that history with Worcester and how one of the first things that I saw that I said, ooh, that looks like an expensive pot, let me try to replicate it, was a book at the library that had Worcester porcelain on it. And, um, and then I grew up with uh, really being uh, in love with this band called the Wu-Tang Clan, which is sort of a band that... Um, combines uh, kung fu soundtracks, it combines R&B, as well as um, nine separate members that all have to figure out how to have an own, own individual voice and identity. And so that hybridization of cultures for me, kind of like in so, so many ways reciprocates all the things that I'm interested in art. And so I sort of figured out a way to combine the two. Another fun fact is I was wearing, I, this is gonna sound so bad, but I had this like photo, this magazine came to like shoot me uh, not shoot me, but take photos of me. <laughs> and I had like this donut in my eyes for like a month because they had this big flash. And um, they recently told me that they're gonna use my image for the cover of the magazine, but I was wearing this, this sweater. And so it just, I heard that this morning and I like had to wear it. Cause I was like, oh, I'm so happy that like the Wu-Tang Clan is gonna be on the front cover of American Craft. You know, <laughs> I think that's fucking awesome. So <laughs> that's why I'm wearing it. <laughs> I had a like jacket and stuff, but I was like, well, people know what time it is. You know, I'm an artist, so it's all good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, uh, some of my students, I teach in undergrad. I'm a uh, professor at Marlboro College in Vermont. And um, some of my students have been making ceramics longer than I have, actually. And um, one of them <laughs> knows a lot more <laughs> about just everything there is to know about clay than I do. But he's taking classes with me. And I find that really great because we have these things called tutorials, which are one-on-one -on -one classes. And so I'm taking a class with him. He's taking a class with me on Japanese uh, ceramics. 
and sort of the unknown craftsmen as well as folk pottery. And so what I'm doing since I don't know any of this information is sort of I'm using my um, my relationship with people that I've met throughout the years to interview all these people that are experts on it. And so he and I just come to class and we Skype someone every day. And then we both take notes and ask questions. And so that's really the class. And, um, and so we had a really funny moment the other day where he's much cooler than I. And we were throwing pottery the other day. And he went outside to grab some leaves. And you know, this is a very Vermont thing to do. And you grab some leaves and you rub it on your pot to make the impression and sort of this relationship that he has with nature. And so I got really inspired by what he was doing. And I went out and I did the same thing. And we were kind of having this moment. And then this other girl comes in and she's like, look at your pottery, it's so natural. And I just like, I was really embarrassed. So I like broke the pot. <laughs> But I'm constantly learning from them because, you know, in reality, we're all experts of something. And it, it, even when we critique, we're sort of always um, leaning our criticism and our conversation towards our expertise because it's sort of what we know, right? And so if you're not sharing your expertise, you're asking a question. And so I find that because they have all these personal experiences and backgrounds, it really has helped me exponentially to grow as an artist. And um, I, I, oft, I actually find that I've only been teaching in college for about four months that I'm much more fearless than I used to be. You know, I'm not afraid to actually call people out and um, to sort of have some conviction with the things that, um, that are important to me. So it's been really um, great in that way. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. So one of the things is, is um, I actually applied for, uh, <laughs> I had this list I put online of every show that I had been declined for in one year. So in that one year, I applied for 100 exhibitions, and I was accepted to one exhibition. And um, since then, I've haven't had to apply to anything. I've get, gotten just invited to stuff. But it was all these red dots and just one green one. And what I realized was is that whole time I was applying for ceramic shows. I was trying to get into cup shows. I was trying to like be a part of this, be a part of that. And I realized that there was like no precedent um, for the most part for what I was doing. And so what I needed to do in my particular case was show in art venues and then have them go, why is that ceramic artist in that art venue? Why isn't he showing with us? You know, let's, let's invite him. And then I get invited and it's so much better to be invited than have to apply to something. And so, um, but yeah, I, you know, and I think the reason why I've always tried to uh, be involved in the ceramic scene is because it's the first place in my entire life that I've ever felt like I belong somewhere and it was a really warm feeling where you felt like 24 hours a day you can go to the studio and somebody's going to say what's up you're probably going to share a bagel and high five and then you're going to make work and so it was like this really great thing new found like family you know and so I always felt like I had to be a part of this family and what I realized is that sometimes in order to serve and feed my family, I need to be able to like show elsewhere because sometimes, for example, the people where I come from may not be able to afford some of my pots, but I think in some ways that sort of seeing me as a teacher, I go and I volunteer at these places to teach, but also to sort of represent their culture is just as effective because I'm setting the precedent for them to be able to do it on their own. And it doesn't have to be as a consumer. I don't have to trick them or talk them into being able to buy one of my cups. It could just come in the form of them sort of participating either as a viewer or eventually as a maker. And so um, I've had to sort of define those opportunities. This summer, I'm starting a, a pottery study abroad program in Puerto Rico, where my parents come from. And I've actually never been to Puerto Rico other than a cruise stop. And so I'm going there. And um, my parents said when it was to rain, they would go outside and make clay sculptures. And so I know that the clay there is this terracotta. So I'm going there taking clay samples. I'm bringing an ethnographer. I'm bringing um, a food scientist. And I'm bringing a musician. And we're all going to sort of study do kind of an ethnographic study of the, the culture there and then create a pottery program where people there can create an, another income stream um, as well as become a, a destination for artists to go and residence um, and make work in a beautiful island. So those are the sort of type of things that I'm, I'm wanting to do. And so, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Sorry, am I talking too much? <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah.
So I, I'm really, I, I'm trying to get a little bit away of the pluralization of art. Like I, I, I'm even a little bit uncomfortable standing here talking about Roberto Lugo, Roberto Lugo, where I feel like there's so much better and more uh, worthy work being done um, by groups of people. And so in some ways, I, I just hope to like use my name to be able to facilitate those things, you know, and create that program. And so some ways by me having a better career, I can sort of institute that. So um, if anybody has any more questions, just come up to the front and see me. I'll be here all day for your talk and pleasure. Uh, <laughs> but thank you guys so much for having me. Thanks.